why truth and justice is not the Canberra way, and one year on from the Al Aqsa flood. Coming up on the Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 10th of October 2024. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's show, we're going to talk about the pathological unwillingness of the Australian government to ever compensate anybody for anything, um, even the things that they are the cause of the damage for, um, which is shocking. And Craig, on a more... Um, uh, sensitive note, it's the uh, one year anniversary of the October 7 attack by Hamas, which of course has um, had enormous consequences in that uh, part of the world. And we're going to talk about what we know about that one year on. Mm -hmm. um, first, of course, uh, what the Citizens Party does when we do this show is not just commentary. We are here to change the things that we talk about and we need your help to do that. And the way you can do that is um, like, help us get it you know, widely viewed on YouTube. So boost the algorithm, like the show, share it on social media yourself, subscribe if you're not a subscriber, and remember to ring the bell icon to um, get updates that we do. Um, comment below, please comment. I try and participate as much as I can with the time I've got. If you've got questions, um, put them below and just any general feedback, put them in the comments below. We appreciate that. Um, and of course, there's a donate button there as well where you can donate directly to the Citizens Party's activities. Uh, and we have a lot of them, including, yeah. um, uh, have, I think we've finished our 2024 yeah. seminars. Yes, well, actually, always one big one to come, but we've just finished 13 of the Shake Your Chain seminars. We, yep. just, we were just down in Hobart on the weekend, another successful uh, seminar down there. 13 seminars, over 800 people participated in this face to face, and they've always been a lot of fun. All day but, seminars. All day seminars, yeah. And uh, I think uh, people that came really oh, the, from the feedback were very, very impressed and enjoyed the information we were able to give people. We, it's a, it's a, it's a rare thing where you can actually sit down and uh, you know participate in a discussion about real issues. Mm. There's one more coming. Um, well, there's a series of follow up meetings in Launceston. Adelaide, uh, Darwin, and even Perth uh, uh, coming up again. Uh, if people want to find out about those, they can always get in contact with us. But there is a big one coming up, Robbie, and that's our uh, national policy launch on the 17th of November. It's going to be held here in Victoria. And if people are interested in that, it'll, be, it'll actually be live streamed yep. on YouTube. And people can participate in person here in Melbourne. It's going to be in a uh, Melbourne Conference Centre. Uh, registration is absolutely an imperative thing. Uh, we won't be allowing anyone in just to walk in off the street uh, because this is a major event in a major venue. Yep. Uh, and what we'll be going through is the launch of the Citizens Party policies. Uh, we've been working on this for quite some time. We intend to stand candidates right across the country. We're bringing together experts uh, at the launch who can speak to the various policies. Yes. Um, and this is what we will be taking to the federal election. But even even before the election, it's these policies that guide our approach to intervening in politics anyway. The theme of the the theme or the the name of the event is Return Government to the People. And we're going to be talking specifically about economic and national sovereignty. Yep. Because that's the key here for our country. And you know, we're constantly talking about that on the Citizens Report, the need for an independent foreign policy. All of these things will be discussed in detail to get people, to give people an opportunity, a sense of the difference, the different policies that the Citizens Party represents from this, you know, Canberra way, as we yeah, yeah, refer we'll, to we'll, it. We'll call it the Canberra way today. So if you're interested in coming to that, definitely uh, contact us to register. Um, we'd love to see you there. Um, and, uh, and, and that'll be the beginning of what will be quite a lot of activity between now and the next federal election. People don't have to register for the YouTube or online event, they'll no. just participate in that on YouTube. All right, now quickly before we begin, um, very brief update uh, on the misinformation and disinformation bill 
look, it's really going to come down to getting the Greens not to support it. Um, the uh, the, the uh, coalition has come out very strongly against it, emphatically strongly, and there's a and, and it's very funny the way they are against it, given that as we've reported here before, they initiated this bill. This was a coalition bill, the you know a law on. Uh, regulating misinformation and disinformation on social media. They instigated it. What's funny about the way they're opposing it now, Craig, is their arguments are rock solid. They are, mm. they are expressing a free speech principled position to go against this. And what's, why that's funny to me <laughs> is because, um, because it's a principled position that they've fallen back on, it's easy for them to explain. Whereas what you hear from most of the time for politicians is them talking in circles and twisting themselves in knots, trying to justify terrible positions on policies that they have to scam the public on. And it's all political gook. I've never heard so much clarity from the coalition in, our, in my life. Now, so they get ripped up after the election if they happen to rip wrong. Exactly. You cannot trust wrong. them for a second. No. But that's, that's not germane to this bill. This no. bill... Albanese's version of the mad bill is not going to get the support of the coalition. Not because they had that principle, they're just arguing the principle. Because they saw the writing on the wall in terms of the public backlash first. And, and the part that I noticed, because I know we, we once got um, this very sage advice years ago, 25 plus years ago, from uh, the Liberal politician Wilson Tucky who said to our WA representative, Gene Robinson, he said, politicians don't read letters, they count them. <laughs> and Jane Hume, Senator Jane Hume, who we call the Senator for Bankers, when she was arguing on TV last week about why the Liberals are opposed to this bill, she couldn't help but reference the fact that the exposure draft of this bill received 24,000 submissions. And that is an enormous um, public input into an exposure draft of a bill, 24,000 that got their attention. So they're, they're, they're running away from it as fast as they can. The, the Labor Party is sticking to it. And the only reason they, they are at the moment is because as of right now, the Greens have not decided their position. They need the Greens support to get it through the Senate. There's six independents, but that's not enough. They need the Greens support plus two of those independents. And the problem with the Greens is they're actually wishy-washy on this. Now they should be the strongest voice against this bill Partly because, just say, for instance, the, the way the Greens advocated for Julian Assange, they should, just from that position alone, they should know that the mm. government wants to control information online, right? And that shouldn't be allowed. Um, but unfortunately, they've, been, they've convinced themselves of two things, Craig. That one, the narrative that Donald Trump, who, you know, the Greens, especially the, the, the women senators of the Greens, hate Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the product of social media disinformation. We wouldn't have had him without that. Ignoring the fact that what really got Trump elected was just the total collapse of the American industrial economy over 30 years of, of absolute sabotage, the financialization of America, the rise of Wall Street to rule everything. That's why people voted for Trump, not because of social media disinformation. So they, they've been, they, they've swallowed BS right there. Um, and the other one is they think this is taking on the big tech companies. Mm. And ironically, it's, that's irrelevant to, action, to, it, to, to the argument, actually. It's not about the big tech companies. It's about, can we speak freely on... We're on social media now, YouTube. Can we speak freely on social media? This bill will actually consolidate the big American tech companies because it imposes so much onerous regulation for disclosure on the tech companies. Only the big ones will be able to afford it. You will not have the rise of new independent social media if this bill passes, right? You will be stuck with Facebook or Meta, you know, Twitter, et cetera. That's all you'll get. And that's why the, they've, they've got to be set straight on that. However, I still think that um, even with the Greens, it's not, it's not the arguments that are going to persuade them as much as it's the volume of public opposition. So they, between now and when Parliament returns in late November, which is the last chance, last sitting of Parliament for the year, call the Greens. And if you've called the ones in your state, call the ones in other states. We'll put the link below where you can get the, the senators' numbers. Call them. Get able to people to call them. They are the ones that must declare, come out and declare their opposition to this bill. 
if we're going to be it. All right, so there's the update there. Um, uh, that is one aspect of the Canberra way, but let's mm -hmm. talk about this this other thing that is just you know gobsmacking to me, and it's one of the things that you know makes me angry more than anything. Why truth and justice is not the Canberra way. We'll start with the truth bit, Craig. Um, this is a country that that puts truth tellers who are otherwise known as whistleblowers in jail. And um, one of the reasons we're talking about that today is because good news yesterday was that David McBride, the war crime, the Afghan war crimes whistleblower, was given leave by a judge to appeal. Now he had to be given leave because there's an expiry, that there's a sort of a set time where you can automatically appeal and that had expired, so the judge gave him leave. leave. So now David McBride will appeal his sentence and there's a hearing, I think, scheduled for March. And meanwhile, he's still in prison, Robbie, all that time. That's absolutely disgusting. Well, and, and this is what this is the, the Canberra way bit because yeah. he shouldn't be in there because the whole time, the Attorney General of Australia, Mark Dreyfus, and his predecessor in the Liberal Party they had the, the, op, the option to declare his whistleblowing had been in the public interest. And therefore, even though it involved breaking the law necessarily to do it, one of the, the law including, you know, he was charged with theft because when he, <laughs> this is the only humorous part of the David McBride story, he put, he, um, uh, in the Defence Department, there's two different coloured paper one for classified material, one for unclassified material. And so he used the photocopier to cut, to classify, to photocopy. I think uh, one of them is pink. You can go back and look at my interview with him. I'm not clear on it. Anyway, I think he, he copied he copied this classified material onto pink paper, which was unclassified. And so when he took it out of the building and the security Thank looked goodness. at what he had, they just saw it was pink and said they didn't, not only did they let him go, they helped him load the car, yeah. right? He was charged with theft of stationery for doing that. So it's clearly not a serious crime, but necessarily a crime, nevertheless a crime. But it was in the act of blowing the whistle, right? That's what he was doing. He was taking that material for the media. It was in the act of blowing the whistle. So the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, had the option to say, well, given that his whistleblowing resulted in the Brereton Inquiry, which confirmed war crimes in Iraq, um, which has led to charges against war criminals, which has led to a national backlash against this, which has led to Australia paying compensation to the families of the 39 people who were identified as having been unlawfully killed, then clearly it was better that Australia knew that information than not knew it. Clearly, therefore, David McBride did a public service. He did something for the country. Therefore, he, what he did was in the public interest. Therefore, he shouldn't have faced charges. But that's not the Canberra way, Rob, because the idea is to punish anyone that wants to come forward and make sure yep. that all the secret deals and all the corruption, real corruption, that yep. the NAC never gets to, never never sees the light of day because people know that the uh, the system, the justice, it's not justice, yep. right? It's a political operation to make sure that the Entrenched yeah. powers stay entrenched. They punish the current one to stop the next one. Yes. That's what they're trying to do. And that's this is a right? system of, uh, of governance we've had in this country for a hell of a long time. Yep. It's not new. So we'll, we'll follow... The, the David McBride um, appeal is going to be very, really crucial, right? And people should um, get behind that. We'll put the link to the um, appeal page below. Another case, quickly, Craig, is Richard Boyle, who was the ATO whistleblower. Mm -hmm. Richard Boyle's revelations also shocked the country. It's led to changes in the ATO in how they go about their business, but the government's refusing to declare what he's done in the public interest. He's facing prosecution. He faces 150 years in jail for what he did, right? And in the meantime, there's a, you know, so his case hasn't come up yet for the court, but there's a sort of Damocles hanging over his head and it sends it, it from the moment that the government applies these charges. It doesn't. The, the message isn't set when the person is is is, uh, is found guilty and sentenced. It's sent when the charges are applied. And so the, the whole country's the, on notice. The, the, yeah, the follow-on from this, Robbie, is incredible because if you have an institution, either government department or whatever, that knows the government doesn't support whistleblowers and you can get away with this stuff, yep. 
then this is when all the corruption and stuff can just continue to blow out and blow out. If you had a culture which says and protected whistleblowers seriously and said, if you come forward and tell, uh, you know, uh, make serious allegations that about how government departments or other entities function, they'll have a way of self-controlling mm. the entire process. I mean, you don't need to have the knack and so forth where you've got that sort of uh, ability for people to shine a very strong line, a light on my very famous metaphor, the cockroaches that live under the fridge. Yep. Right? Burn the fridge and the cockroaches scatter. Uh, absolutely. I say this is what the point is that uh, they're trying to ban the light uh, in order to stop this you ever process. Thought of having your place fumigated? Oh, yeah. Well, really. <laughs> absolutely. Back to David McBride for a second because I, I was just remiss not to mention this. So this week, uh, it was on 7 30, the, the Brereton. Re report inquiry, Richard Miles, the Defence Minister, has now finally closed it. It's now declared closed. And the 39 cases of established war crimes in Iraq, it, it turns out that the evidence he compiled, because he could compel witnesses to give evidence, but in exchange for being compelled to give evidence, they were, not a, they were, they were told they would not be um, implicating themselves. So no charges can be bought, brought against those people who confessed to him about the crimes. And therefore, no charges are going to flow from that Brereton report. None. Mm. Even though 39 people were killed, right? So clearly, Australians unlawfully killed. Clearly, Australians did wrong. There will be no charges from that report. Um, the, the, the army commanders who got stripped of their medals a month ago, are all they're not the top, really top brass and they're all unidentified. So no one will know who lost their medals over this, in, this war crime saga in Australia in, in terms of Afghanistan. No one knows that. So the only person who's been punished is the whistleblower. Um, another whistleblower, Craig, is, and this is an older case, but it's just, just to make the point that we're not just plucking two cases out of nowhere. Witness K. So who is Witness K? Witness K was the officer of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, ACES, which is Australia's branch of MI6, which is the Secret Intelligence Service. And that is it. And, and trust me, they are not independent. It is Australia's branch of MI6. That's how it works. Um, uh, he, he blew the whistle when Alexander Downer, the then foreign minister, deployed ASIS to go and bug East Timor's embassy so that we, Australia on behalf of Woodside Petroleum, could have an advantage in the negotiations with East Timor over who controlled their oil. And um, that's what Witness K did, and then he blew the whistle on it because this was being used. He, 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 you know, he, he saw that we were bullying this tiny country. And if you ever want to see something inspire, th this inspired me at least, there's a transcript you can actually read going back to 2002, I think, or, or around then when Alexander Downer, who's a big white Australian guy, is negotiating with the then Prime Minister of East Timor, Mari al Qatari, who's a really tiny little um, Timorese guy, but who was a, a veteran, um, you know, guerrilla uh, soldier mm -hmm. against the Indonesians. And, and Alexander Downer was, was, he was at his pompous British git best, right? Just totally bloviating, trying to intimidate this person we saved you from the Indonesians. You owe us your oil. And this little pint-sized guy, he just gave it back to him so hard it wasn't funny. And it's, it's fantastic that that was actually transcribed that way. But when Downer was doing that, he was doing it on behalf of Woodside Petroleum, right? And that's, that's what it was always about. We, we, we did all this great virtue signaling. Oh, look, we're helping out the East Timorese. Yeah, we wanted their oil. And now it, it's Witness K is sort of relevant again because the East Timorese uh, leadership... Um, Shinana Guzmao and um, uh, the other gentleman whose name skips on mine at the moment uh, uh, are saying to Australia, look, let's, let's finalise this oil arrangement, right? Because um, if you don't, well, we'll have to go elsewhere. And the, the, I think it's the, UA, the UAE is willing to fund a, a refinery in Timor. The Chinese are willing to fund a refinery in Timor. Australia wants to do the deal, but we don't want Timor to have a refinery because that's where the money is. Yeah. The money, the wealth is really made in the refinery. We want to treat them as a colony, right? So that we, that our companies get all the wealth from it here. 
and they want the refinery in Darwin. Um, and and uh, the the leadership of East Timor is saying, well, if you, you know, you, you, we'll do a deal with China, and you'll attack us for doing a deal with China, even though you sold the port of Darwin to the, Chinese, the, at least yeah. the port of Darwin to the Chinese. If we did that, all hell would break loose. Um, but our sovereignty comes first, right? And um, the, the, I admire the way the Timorese are, are, are taking this on. Anyway, that, that's just a bit of an, an aside. Um, so those are the whistleblower examples. Now compensation and. Uh, we're raising this um, this week because the other thing that happened beside David McBride is we've written an article in the alert by Richard Barden. Canberra throws vaccine injured to the wolves because last week the vaccine injury compensation scheme that was brought in that many, many other countries have this and have had it for decades. Australia has been an outlier in never having had a compensation scheme and a compensation scheme does not mean the government is saying vaccines are dangerous. A compensation means the government is saying vaccines can be dangerous for some people. And therefore, if some people have inadvertently been in, injured by a vaccine, we, the government, will compensate them. Yeah, it, right? comes, it comes from the idea of the public good, Robbie, from the point of view that if the government says to the, to the population, we need you to be vaccinated, yeah. right, there has to be an element of goodwill in that and say, look, if there's problems with it, we'll look after you. Yeah. So it's a two-edged story. The government can't come out and say, well, what they did get into with COVID is, is the mandates because this was literally throwing out that goodwill, right? Because this... It's called the goodwill you're talking about has, is a, it's called reciprocal justice. Judge, justice, yes, exactly right. And that's, that's the point with any sort of uh, vaccine in, in injury compensation scheme. It's recognising that the greater good may require large numbers of people to be vaccinated, but there is going to be problems. How could there not be? I mean, none of these things are perfectly um, uh, safe because every individual every person is, is different. different. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and that's that's what the understanding is supposed to be. So, we're, so what, in having this discussion, we're not trying to debate vaccines per se, but this was something the government set up, this compensation scheme, but they set it up extremely reluctantly in 2021, and it's already expired. It expired last week, even though other many other countries have a standalone system that's just there for all compensation for all vaccine injuries. Right? Um, we don't do that. And and when we did it for this short period of COVID, we made it incredibly hard to access. On average, a thousand pages of paperwork, Craig, 200 to 450 days for responses. And of the 4,426 claims made to this compensation scheme in Australia, only 378 have been paid out. Less than 10% have been paid out. And the average amount was $78,000, um, which is an average, which strikes me, frankly, in this era of high inflation. It's, well, pretty, it's, not, it's, it's pretty low. Well, very right? low, Robbie. You're talking about someone who's incapacitated, they can't work. Yeah. They've got mortgages and stuff that would be blown in less than a year, you know, less than two years. Exactly. Easily. And that's ridiculous. And of course, one of the reasons the government did it is, because, is to do the deal with Pfizer. They had to indemnify Pfizer against any claims made directly against Pfizer. Um, and Pfizer was able to make a lot of money. And, and I'll, I'll point out the Senator, Jared Rennick, who talks about this general subject a lot, but one of the other things he talks about is the tax um, dodging. They've also allowed Pfizer to do on top of it all, mm -hmm. um, uh, just by letting them letting them transfer their actual revenue out of Australia. So that wouldn't be a problem if we still had CSL, Robbie, and we're at manufacturing mm -hmm. our own vaccines inside the country, where the benefit and the profits were able to remain inside. Well, you take the well, well because CSL was publicly owned. There was no profit motive. I know. And yeah. and and if you could take and I think, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. CSL was the first company Paul Keating privatised. Yeah. It had a it had a stellar record as Australia's vaccine manufacturer, and it actually developed vaccines in its history, etc. Um, I think one of them was the tetanus vaccine. Um, and when the Australian public were told that's the vaccine you needed, they knew well. The person telling me that isn't trying to profit from me, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it actually helps to build the confidence. Well, we don't a, have that anymore. Th this is where the profit motive for private corporation can be absolutely demonstrated. Also by what you said to our Hobart forum about the Commonwealth Bank. Yeah. You know, because the Commonwealth Bank 
has made a hundred billion dollars worth of profit since it was privatised in the first twenty years after in the first twenty years, and I think the government sold it for for eight or nine seven. billion seven billion dollars, right? And see, the point is that oh, you know, that money, that hundred billion dollars, has to be seen as the service that has been ripped out of the community, yeah, yep. because it wasn't designed as a, as a public bank. It was employing people in the local towns, providing branches. Right, so it never made a, a profit service. like that. That was the value that it that it's that it provided by its service. As soon as it was privatised, yep. they shut down branches and they monetarised yep. the savings to put into the hands of private shareholders. You know, the Commonwealth Bank shares, are, I think they're about one hundred and thirty dollars at the moment. CSL's shares are now two hundred and sixty. So that I mean, the, the, all that wealth yep. measured in share prices has been sucked out of the community because this is the nature of the neoliberal. Agenda. So, that, so they've created, they unleashed the corporate wolves. On it. They handed over a huge chunk of our actual economy and services and government to those corporate wolves. They've thrown the Australian public to the corporate wolves. And then they say, trust me. And they refuse uh, to compensate them when things go wrong. Like right? you take these vaccines from private corporations that we've allowed to exist, yep. privatised, uh, you know, and um, you know, you know, you're on your own. Again, caveat emptor, buy yeah. beware, or user beware in this case. Um, and this is not a one-off. So we actually, in looking at this case, so um, people can, we'll actually probably put this article on our website so people can read it, but um, it's not a one-off. This is, when I read, when I learned about this, I'd already been on the warpath about all these other things the government never compensates for. And that's why I described it as pathological. This is Australian governments, and it's not Labor or Liberal, it's both of them. Australian governments are pathologically opposed to privatising people who have been wronged by the actions of governments. You mean... Um Compensate. Compensate. People, not for privatise. We don't oh, want they're, to they're not opposed please, to privatising. Let's not privatise people. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, so another quick example, Craig, is there's, a, there's Senator Malcolm Roberts has actually made it quite an issue of this. There's a there's a hepatitis contaminated blood transfusion scandal, which didn't just happen in one country. It happened in Australia. There were victims of it in Australia, where people were, had blood transfusions with blood that was contaminated with hepatitis, and of course it made them very very sick. Um, but it's happened in other countries. Canada and the UK both conducted inquiries and owned up to this and compensated the victims. Australia acknowledges that this happened here, but refuses to compensate. Um, financial victims. Now, the ones that are close to our heart are the Sterling First victims in WA who through the, through the, um, the just the, the cavalier negligence of ASIC and through the whatever game the WA Consumer Affairs Department played and actually helping the scammers design the product so it was legal instead of looking at the product and saying, hang on, is this a, is this a legit product? Um, 130 elderly people fell foul of this financial scam called the Sterling First Rent for Life Scheme, um, lost $18.5 million. It's a cheap compensation to keep 130 elderly people in their homes. Our friends are, who we talk to regularly are being evicted now, from their homes, two weeks ago, Beryl and Ray Taylor, who I interviewed Beryl on this show on Citizens Insight at this desk back in 2021. You can watch our, my interview with her. She is now homeless, right? They, they fought five years to save their home. They're now living in a caravan. Um, uh, you know, they, this, and this is happening repeatedly because their, their sort of leases, are, the leases such as they were are expiring and they've got nowhere to go. Eight and a half million will compensate them. This, the, the federal government claimed they would, the current federal government, Stephen Jones, the, the minister, he went over and met the Sterling victims before the election last year. Um, the first thing he said was, oh, we can't compensate you directly. No government would do that. And they, when they reported back to me, he said that, I'm thinking, why? Why? What damn principle is involved that you can't compensate them directly? Why? What? Eight and a half million dollars. I mean, these people waste that for the first second of their working day as a government in thinking, what can we splurge money on? And they cannot say, well, because of ASIC, because of this, let's compensate these people, right? So then he said, but we'll include you in this special scheme we're going to set up because the pressure has been building on the government ever since the Royal Commission, because the Royal Commission highlighted that since 2008, 200,000 Australians have lost $40 billion on managed investment schemes. And... The Royal Commissioner said those schemes going back to 2008 should all be looked at 
for whether they should those victims should be compensated, right? Managed investment schemes. So the Labor, the Labor Party, Stephen Jones said to the Sterling victims, we will include you in that compensation scheme of last resort when we legislate it because you're a managed investment scheme. Mm. When he legislated it, as soon as they got elected, they excluded managed investment schemes. Not only breaking the direct promise of the Sterling First victims, but those 200,000 Australians and who've lost $40 billion, we're not gonna compensate you either. And the reason they did that, Craig, is quite simple. Of those schemes, um, a whole chunk of them were associated with the big banks. Mm -hmm. And if the government looked at those and decided, well, that deserves compensation, that deserves compensation, the government would have to, in order to be fair, would have to say to the banks, well, you've just made 30, you, 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 bank, you big four banks make th more than $30 billion combined profit a year. You're gonna help pay for the compensation. Or you're gonna pay for, in some cases, pay for all of it. Oh, you can't do that, right? Um, so total, this is the sort of thing they do. Um, look at other go government failings we could talk about. Robo debt, mm. right? Um, look at the way they treat the, 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 the military veterans and returned soldiers and just the, with all the suicide rates, etc. And the ways who come back and the, and the lack of support for PTSD and all those sort of things, right? They got to be dragged. They, you know, they, 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 they glorify the Australian soldier, you know, before the event before the war and then abandon them after the war when, they're, when, when they rec their, their country... And that's a long history in our country, Robert. No, exactly, exactly. Um, why, is it, why does the government have to be like this? So that's the, that's the way they, they, they act on all these fronts. Con let's contrast it with who does get compensated. And I'll give you two examples. Um, just before the federal election in 2022, the Liberal government no questions asked, whipped out at $750,000 to compensate a Liberal staffer named Rochelle Miller, who said she'd had an affair with a Liberal minister, Alan Tudge. Quick, compensate her, shut her up. After the election, the Labor government whips out $2 million in compensation for a Liberal staffer, Brittany Higgins, because of what happened to her, but because also it was something that Labor had decided it wanted to politicise for political purposes. $2 million, bang, like that, right? Yet keep 130 elderly people in their homes, compensate, you know, it's, it's $2 million for her, $78,000 average for vaccine injury victims who only took vaccines because the government said they had to, that sort of thing. I mean, this is the Canberra way, and it is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. And we cannot, the, the fact that it's bipartisan, is why people need to start voting for parties that have a totally different approach. It's why even, I mean, we're gonna plug our party, we do represent a different approach, but frankly, most of the parties on the cross benches now that the, the major parties are freaking out about, the reason they're there is because they all are in one way or another kind of responding to these kinds of problems in the community, right? And are far more sincere than anybody in the major parties. Um, instead of, instead of uh, uh, justice for all, in Australia, the Canberra way is justice for none. Um, all right, let's move on from that and onto the very sensitive subject, and I'm, and I'm being serious there, one year on from the Al Axa flood. We've got a few things to say about this because it's, it's hyper-politicised at the moment, which is, you know, which is understandable, of course, um, but because it's a year on, it's, to me, Craig, there's no point in just dwelling on what happened a year ago You've actually got to see what happened, what does what happened a year ago mean about what happened before, and what does what happened since mean about what happened a year ago and what happened before, right? Because there's, there's a lot more clarity now. I remember how shell shocked I was when the reports came through of the Hamas attack. It was a shocking thing that we heard about, and it's like if you go back and a year ago and look at our shows then, I think that kind of shell shock came through in our shows. Mm -hmm. And all we could all we could sort of do because we like talking about solutions here, um, all we could sort of do is say, look, you know, these, this was like, this was the definition of an intractable conflict. You know, how are we ever going to solve it? I remember we pointed to the fact that, you know, there are things in the world where you can show you can resolve even intractable conflicts. And we pointed to the fact that the Chinese have just done a, got the Saudis and Iranians to do a deal 
with each other and they've hated each other longer than Israel exist, has existed, those two countries, right? And if the Chinese could do that, you, you know, you, there is ways to do it. Anyway, that's the sort of thing we were pointing to because we didn't actually have anything concrete to point to about you know, the, this quite horrific Hamas attack. But then um, something else has uh, emerged. First of all, it is now proven that not all, but a lot, and, and all of the very worst stuff we were told about the October 7 attack was all made up. Yes, 1,200 people died, but all the worst stuff. Now, I actually don't want to go through the list of the worst stuff. Um, we, the, all the, you could call it atrocity porn. All the worst atrocities, all the stuff that just made your stomach churn to do with babies and women, etc. Without going through it, I'm sure you've heard it all, all made up, all without evidence. Um, and I want to just mention in that context, there's a, we'll put a link below, there's a new documentary that's just come out by Max Blumenthal from The Grey Zone. It's called Atrocity Inc. And um, now, Max is a Jewish American. He's actually the son of Sidney Blumenthal, Hillary Clinton's political um, aide, who a lot of the, um, the Assange leaks of Hillary Clinton's emails were emails to Sidney Blumenthal, Max's father. Like, for instance, when it was, it, it, one of the, it was Hillary Clinton's email to, to Max's father, Sidney Blumenthal, that shows Hillary Clinton is in, was, was complicit in the murder of Gaddafi in Libya. Why? Because, they, because the Americans told actual ISIS al-Qaeda head choppers where he was and made sure they could get to him. Sydney, and that's confirmed in those emails. So Max Blumenthal is not a nobody. He's very well connected. He also has as much right as anybody to talk about Israel because he's a Jewish American, therefore, he, and, and half, the, half the Jewish people in Israel are Americans. Um, but he is clearly not a, a, uh, a Zionist and he's been an extreme critic of this conflict like he has been of other conflicts because as an American citizen, he opposes um, the lies that go into those wars. And we're going we're to point those out in a minute. So he has pointed out in this video, you can watch it for yourself. And I just, the reason I don't want to talk about it is, I don't want to get bogged in it, but also I don't want to trigger the algorithm. Two weeks ago, we did a story here on our show where we, used, where we talked about um, people taking their lives, people taking their lives, soldiers taking their lives. And the, the YouTube algorithm automatically suppressed our show. Right, and so it got less, you know, maybe a third of the, the, the usual views it would have got. So, but we'll put the link below. People can make the, watch it and make up their own mind on that. Um, one of the reasons I know it's true is I've followed this quite closely. And also, there's just this history of this. Wars are justified by lies, and the lies almost always revolve around claims of atrocities, right? And you can go right back, you can go, um, you can go to famous lies in World War I, such as that the British people were told, oh, the Belgians, I'm um, sorry, German soldiers are bay bayoneting Belgian babies, right? We've got to sign up and go over there and do something about it. So we, we, we gotta, we've got to go serve our king so he can fight his cousin. We'll go, so we've got, to, we've got to follow you know, the king's um, call to go fight his cousin, right? all grandkids of Queen Victoria. Um, because the Germans are, Belgian, are bayoneting Belgian babies. That's what, they're such monsters, utter monsters, right? We ha, we're the good people. We have to go and deal with these monsters. Um, there, was a, there was a particularly famous one you can see on the actual website of the BBC. Um, it's about the famous story where um, the British actually invented a lie that the Germans were shipping their dead soldiers back to Germany to process them into soap. And, and the lie was based on a deliberate mistranslation of the word of the difference between the word corpse and carcass. And a corpse relates to a dead person. A car and it was actually dead horses that were being sent back to Germany to be, to be turned into, so into um, uh, yeah, soap and not, not humans. But they, they invented that lie because they're actually trying to get the Chinese to side with them in World War I at that moment. And they needed an atrocity to, to invent. Um, and so this, this sort of stuff is famous. The Gulf of Tonkin, 
attack that the Americans used as the excuse to go into Vietnam. It was just made up. It was a lie. Um, the, the big one that got around in, in uh, 1990 to justify the, the, uh, the counter-attack against Saddam Hussein when he went to Kuwait was they, um, a, a Kuwaiti girl gave testimony to the US Congress that um, Iraqi soldiers had thrown babies out of the incubators in the Kuwaiti hospitals and it was all made up. She claimed she'd seen it as a witness. It turned out that she was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador in Washington. She went to a Washington school. She hadn't been in Kuwait for months and months and months. She just made it up. And she cried and everything. She was a brilliant actor, right? But this was confirmed later. The whole thing was just made up. The, 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 the one that really got me, and I shouldn't laugh about it, but it's just, I just remember when it first came out, we were, we were heavily involved in trying to stop the Iraq war in 2002. And I, my job was to clip the newspapers in those days. And this story broke that Saddam Hussein had a human-sized shredding machine and that he and his sons Uday and Kuze used to kill their enemies. And if they wanted to show you mercy, they put you in head first. Oh. And if they wanted to make you suffer, they put you in feet first. Yeah, the shock factor of that, so, such ideas is what gets people. Exactly. It's designed to do that, right? Yeah. Oh, it's so, you know, and you lose all reason. So when they finally went into Iraq, they couldn't find weapons of mass destruction, and they admitted that eventually. You know what they also admitted later? Couldn't find the human shredding machine either. Yeah. I mean, it's only a man-sized thing. It, it must have existed somewhere. No, it was made up. The whole yeah. thing was made up. And then you've got to say, well, why? Who, why do they want to make this stuff up? They want to make this stuff up because they're trying to justify what they are planning to do. Yes. Right? And in this case, back to the, the October 7 claims, the people who made up those claims wanted to justify what we can now see as extermination. Um, so what the Citizens Party did, once, we, once the dust settled and we could see what was going on, um, we, has, we, we intervened in this debate starting in December, Craig. We put out our, um, our special report about the uh, Temple Mount plot, right? The, the Made in London Temple Mount plot. We'll put a picture on the screen so you can see it. And there's a, there's a link to it below where people can actually read that. We didn't take this back to, to this argument, oh, you know, it's... it's History didn't start on October 7, it started in 1948. Now we actually show, well, hang on, it's even bigger than that, right? And what we're dealing with is British imperialism. It's the legacy of British imperialism where the British said, well, we want, to, we want a foothold in the Middle East so we can divide and conquer that area. And they saw the creation of Israel as a way to do that. And that went back to the 1840s. And it's, anyway, it's all in, it's all in our report. And British imperialism, Robbie, has a long history. Look at the opium wars in China and what was done by the British to the, the Chinese. Go back and look what was done in India against the Indian population, the starvation. And the, there's many, many books being sure. written about this now that show that this actually, what is happening in the Middle East, is not out of format. It is not unusual where you're dealing with the hand of the British in British imperialism, this, this idea. Well, now one of the manifestations, or probably the main manifestation of British imperialism is this more recent political phenomenon in the Anglo-American countries called neoconservatism, the neocons. And of course, they, if you know the recent history, they drove the Iraq war, they controlled the George W. Bush administration, etc. Robert, I mean, sorry, Benjamin Netanyahu, the current Israeli prime minister, was one of those neocons, right? I want to play a very quick clip here, just 10 seconds, about what he said in, when he wasn't a prime minister. 2002, he testified to the US Congress why they must um, topple Saddam Hussein and look at what he promises. If you take out Saddam, Saddam's regime, I guarantee you, that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. So you look at that, and that has to go with, one of the, with, with the rest of the lies about the Iraq war. Instead of positive reverberations about the re throughout the region that he promised, it's now a hellscape. That wow. Iraq invasion set off this chain of events that's turned the whole region into a hellscape. Um, uh, Netanyahu... Then when he cobbled together a, a, a government back in last year, sorry, the end of 2022, to, to do that government, to, to form that government, he did what had never been done before. He brought in the people that we identify in our report, Craig, who are the, the most extreme, we, the, the world's been obsessed about Islamic, Islamist terrorism and extremism. But while we've been obsessed about that, Israel has increasingly been taken over by Jewish messianic extremism who want to bring about the end of the world. They want to bring about Armageddon and the end of the world. They want to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, 
on the Temple Mount so they can rebuild Solomon's Temple. Um, but the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third holiest site in, in Islam. It'll, it'll spark World War III if they did that. But they want World War III. It's part of their, it's, it, they, 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 they're saturated in biblical prophecy, right? Um, and this is, this is how these people think. They'd never been in government before until Netanyahu brought them in. And then from late 2022, when they brought into government, he, they, they immediately spent a whole year of provocations. They did things like the month before the October 7 attack, they held a cabinet meeting under the Al-Aqsa Mosque, in the, in the tunnels under the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and made it public, right? Because they, tell, they were saying to the, to the Muslim world, we've got designs on this place, etc. They brought in these red heifers from Texas, which are part of biblical prophecy that when the red heifer sacrifice is made, then the temple will, will be rebuilt, except this mosque is in the way and it would be involved destroying the mosque. Um, they believe they are obeying God to establish Israel on the land that God gave to Abraham, which is not the current, which is not the 1948 slash 1967 borders of Israel. It's from the river to the sea, but it's also some of them want it from the Nile River in the south all the way to the Euphrates River in Iraq, right? And and you can, if if I can help the producer, I'll, I'll find you a, um, a an example of a patch of that map, which is a much bigger idea of Greater Israel that. IDF soldiers support on their sh uh, have on their shoulders to say you know people actually have this um, idea. Now if you look at a map, and I'm, I haven't told the producer yet, but I want to indulge me with a bit of an animation here. You can <laughs> we'll have a look at this map of Israel. Um, th so this is the current map of Israel. This is the land that Israel controls. The whole Israel controls the whole thing. So it controls Israel proper, the West Bank, Gaza, and the Galan Heights. There's 14 million people live in this area, but only 9 million of them get to vote. 7 million Jews and 2 million Arabs. They're the only ones who get to vote. There's 5 million people who are essentially stateless and do not get to vote. Um, Israel opposes a one-state solution where all would get to vote because then they would be outnumbered by the Arabs if, in a one-state solution. Um, now, a two-state solution would solve that, give the Arabs their state, give the Israelis their state, except we're going to play a clip now where Israel has always sabotaged that as well. And in fact, the combination of the long-term sabotage of that plus these extremists, these, these um, Jewish extremists, is setting up the extermination part because the other solution is one state, but all the Arabs expelled from that one state. So we're going to play a clip from Alistair Crook um, Alistair Crook is one of the world's top Arabists. He's, he's also a former MI6 officer who was int who's been intimately involved in all these processes for the last, you know, dec for, for decades in the Middle East. I just want to play you this clip where he's talking about whether there was any genuine attempt to achieve peace or not. Do you think there was ever a period over the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years, that there was a genuine desire on the part of anyone in Israel to actually negotiate with the Palestinians to establish a, a Palestinian state? Or was it always, um, uh, I guess, a, a contrivance? You know, they, they paid lip service to it, but were actually were doing everything behind the scenes they could to sabotage it. I've seen, no, I haven't, I can't go back 30, but I can go back 20 years when I was involved uh, there working with Arafat and on the, um, on the Oslo um, process. Uh, and um, when the Oslo process was signed, it, it implied that the Israel would want to create a, a state, a Palestinian state, they would want it for demographic reasons. In other words, that the Palestinians would soon outnumber the Israelis, and therefore it was better if they had the state. But that was the Western view of it. It wasn't the Israeli view of, of, of the situation. Um, but the West thought, and these were the, prem, the premises of the whole Oslo Accords, were, were first of all um, uh, that, you know, that. Um, Israel were wanted. I mean, it would opt for a Palestinian state. Secondly, that the Palestinians therefore had a duty to assure Israel um, of its security. The Palestinians had the duty to secure Israel 
of its uh, assure Israel of its security. And thirdly, Israel alone, not the United States, no one else, would be the judge of when that security had been met and had been achieved. Well, for all these years, it, it hasn't happened. But even at the outset, you know, if there was a sincere wish, um, if there was a sincere wish to have two-state solution, uh, you would have seen um, because it, the two-state solution would require, a, if you like, a separating of resources, water resources, electric resources, uh, land and things would have to be sort of started and prepared for this separation. You know, electricity pylons and everything like this would have to have, you know, quite separate um, structures. None of that occurred. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. From from the beginning, it was uh, going the other way towards, um, if you like, a unitary um, mm -hmm. uh, state that was being being um, uh, established. And Oslo was really just a construct by the Americans, I'm afraid to say, more or less. I, I mean, I think some of them have even admitted that, 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 uh, that they were doing this, that that it was really, you know, it gave ample scope for Israel to sort of delay and postpone, talk a bit about a two-state solution, um, but not actually to 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 mean it. So that's an insider's account. And, and what we've done in the alert service this week, Craig, is actually transcribe this interview with Alistair Crook, and we'll, we will distribute this so people can actually see what he's pointing out is the driving factor here. But I thought it was really fascinating that he actually said this, this, he talked about the practicalities, that if they were genuinely interested in a two-state solution, they would be making moves to separate the infrastructure, because it's not a real state. If, 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 it, if Palestine gets to say, okay, this is your land, but Israel's going to control your electricity and water, yeah. so they've got to make genuine moves there, and they haven't done it. And that's why this is, somewhere, this is something that the Citizens Party and our international associates have always been interested in, we firmly believe economic development is the only true foundation for peace, and that's what Israel is desperately crying out for. It was it was the one part of the OASIS, of the Oslo Accords that wasn't delivered on, mm. and because that wasn't delivered on, which would have helped build this infrastructure, then you know it's helped set up the disaster that's there now. Yeah, I mean, Robbie, what's uh, what strikes me is that uh, unless the people of Israel truly want to seek peace. Right, they're going to have to adopt the Westphalian approach, yep. which means that they have to think about their neighbours. You know, if they don't, and I'm afraid, I think there's a huge number of Israelis right now that believe they don't believe in the two-state solution, which means that this this is a recipe for perpetual war, because how can you exist? How can a, a, a Jewish state exist in amongst the Palestinians? And they say we have every right to exist, but we don't recognise you, and we, we, we want, to, want to get rid of you. Yeah. I mean, it can't. And I think Scott Ritter is pretty, pretty, very, very blunt on this: that you know, unless Israel changes its internal perception, and that includes the people, then it doesn't have the right to exist, and that's frightening. Well, um, I mean, Alastair Crook actually in the larger interview he talks about that this is, has there's been a cultural sea change in within Israel. To the where the the um, the more moderate sort of European type Jews yep. have a, a, are now in a minority, and these these um, messianic people who who think they're living out the end days, and they believe they're following the orders of the Bible, the blood curdling parts in the Old Testament where God says, "Go and slaughter everybody, go and slaughter all the women," in, like in the Book of Samuel, "Go and slaughter all the women, go and slaughter all the children, go and slaughter everybody," right? Which is which is the Old Testament version of of the religion? Um, they they think they're living that out now, and so that's why there's no tolerance. So, and everyone thinks if there are some people listening to think what the Hamas thinks like that. Well, yeah, but you've only ever heard about the Hamas side of it. Hamas thinks like that, and the defining force now in Israel thinks like that, and there's no salute, there's no peaceful path there um, unless we change it. But one thing you can do is look at this question of infrastructure and go, okay, well, let's let's start advocating for the kind of separation of infrastructure, which will require investment, 
require construction, give people jobs. The Chinese have showed that you can raise living standards by building infrastructure, getting yep. people involved in building infrastructure. That would help all of Israel and all of Palestine immensely. Yep. And also, Rob, you've got Chinese in there. You know, Chinese are part of the BRICS grouping of countries. You know, you've seen BRICS come together as a new uh, alternative to the, the Western hegemony that we've had smash the world for the last 50 to 60 years. They're developing diplomatic relations between various Islamic groups and so forth to come together in order to be able to create a government that can function. And if you add then the support of the Chinese from an infrastructure development point of view, which they're going to need, then you can see the solution is around this idea of what we were talking about many years ago of the Oasis Plan. The key is water, it's economic development of all forms in that region and we, the, the, when you get into this, these very fixed, messianic, mm -hmm. lunatic, uh, religious fanaticism, you end up in wars because people can be manipulated, and that's deliberate. And you know, the, the, most of the wars have been done, done in the name of God right throughout history. But you said, but the fact you mentioned the the, the peace of Westphalia, I mean, that brought to an end of the Thirty Years' War, which was between two groups that were just as extreme as any other groups yeah. ever, the Protestants and the Catholics in Germany, right? And they felt all manner of justification for their atrocity reprisals against each other, right? Nevertheless, that treaty brought that to an end after 30 years, and it became the foundation of international law. And that's why the neocons and the neoliberals absolutely hate yep. any discussion of the Treaty of Westphalia because it, again, it shifts the idea of mankind from being a community of principle that can live together harmoniously and develop itself into this idea of what we see in British imperialism of you have a ruling elite, an oligarchy, and you have the masses that are treated like nothing more than human cattle. And what you see in Gaza today is the slaughter of human cattle based upon this ideology. And that's what's so absolutely disgusting. Well, and Max Blumenthal highlights that, highlights that in the video oh, we'll good. link to below, where, yep. where once they establish the false atrocity claims, then it's like these people are animals and we get to treat them as animals. That's right. right? That's and absolutely beyond disgusting. Yep. Um, all right, well... Um, yeah, there's probably not much more we can add to that subject. We will put this material, the links to this material, um, including the Alistair Crook interview uh, below, and then people can read the transcript of what we have in the Australian I'll Alert Service. Just say, well. Robbie, why truth and justice is not the Canberra way? Well, we're seeing the same thing on this subject of course. in Canberra as well, so it's not inconsistent with your national relations. No, that's exactly right. Um, all right, so thanks for uh, tuning into this week's Citizens Report. Thanks. Craig, for yep. joining us today. Thank you. And tune in next week for more. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.